So you finish processing your image, now you want to export it in a format so that you can use it for something, you know, whether it be uploading to social media or printing it in a photo book or whatever. That's where the export selected module comes in, and it's the topic for this video. Let's go. Hi and welcome to episode 47 of Understanding Darktable. I cannot believe I have done 46 episodes of this series and failed to do a video on how to actually export an image. I think I mentioned it in passing in one of the really early videos, but I never actually got around to doing a video specifically on the export module. So let's dive on in. What you can see here on the screen is the selection of images that I've narrowed down from our holiday to Sri Lanka. These are the images that I will end up using for a photo book, or at least some of the images. There's a couple of duplicates there that won't all get put in the book. But now that I've got all of these images processed, I now need to export them into folders as JPEGs so that I can then create my photo book, right? But that's not the only use you might have for your images. So let's have a look at the exported selected module. It is the last module on the right hand side column in the light table view. The first option is target storage. As you can see, we've got a latex book template. I understand that to mean latex is a provider of photo book services, but I am not familiar with their product. We then have a Facebook web album. Now, I tried to use this in testing just before I sat down to start recording. And what I found was you click on the login button and it tells you that it's going to launch a tab in your browser for you to log into Facebook. And I'll just bring this tab across from my browser so that you can see it. When I go to log in, I get this. Facebook has detected that Darktable isn't using a secure connection to transfer information. Until Darktable updates its security settings, you won't be able to use Facebook to log into it. So it would appear that that particular option is a little bit broken at this point in time. I'm not sure if that's going to be fixed anytime soon. I'm guessing if it hasn't been fixed, it's because almost nobody uses it and maybe nobody was even aware that the feature was broken. Okay, so we will move on. The next option is file on disk. This is the one that you're probably going to use 90% of the time, and we'll come back to it in just a sec. The other options, a Flickr web album. Does anyone still use Flickr? Uh, Google Photos. Probably less people using Google Photos than there are using Flickr. PeeWeeGo, which is another image hosting website. Send as email. Now, I found that if I select an image and go with this option, it will immediately try and set up a mail server or a mail account on my system because I don't use locally hosted email. I do everything through Gmail, so I don't have a locally hosted mail account. If you do, you could go through all of this and set something up. I'm not actually going to go there because I really don't have a need for it. Next option, a website gallery. Uh, again, I'm not sure how many people would use this kind of feature. Uh, I think if I was going to do any kind of web-based gallery, I would export the images to file on disk first, and then I would upload them to whatever website I was going to use. And I would probably have software for managing image layout, etc., etc. Most of the other things that are in this dialog box are fairly consistent for all of these target output you know, destinations. So let's jump back to file on disk and we'll work our way through. The next field we've got is the path. Now, this path includes not only the folder structure of where you want to output your images to, but also the very rightmost portion of this path after the last forward slash is also the template for the file name. And as you can see from the pop-up, we can use all 
manner of metadata from the images to create either a folder structure or a complex file naming schema for the exported images. Now, I have a whole bunch of presets which you can see here, and most of these only differ in where the files are being exported to. So if I go to say my Instagram preset, it's home, Bruce, pictures, Instagram, and then using the existing file name as the file name of the output file. Now, I don't rename my files. Some people do. I tend to just leave them with the default names as they came from the camera. And when I do my exports, I still leave the default file name. It's just, it's exporting as JPEG, you know, where the original was a raw file. I will leave you to explore that. You can see from that pop-up, there is a whole bunch of metadata you can use to create complex naming algorithms for the exported images if you really want to. Next up, we've got on conflict, create unique file name. Now this is the default behavior for this module. What it means is if you go to export an image or a bunch of images to a particular folder and images already exist in that folder with file names that match the image or images that you are about to export, then Darktable will not overwrite them. It will create unique file names, which means it'll probably append onto the end of the file name, open brackets, one, close brackets, and you know, open brackets, two, close brackets, etc., etc. So that's the default behavior. If you know that you actually want to overwrite any existing images in the destination folder, you can simply select overwrite from that dropdown and any existing files will get overwritten. Now, as a built-in safety mechanism, after you have exported an image or a bunch of images, this will always jump back to create unique file name. So you are always protected from accidentally overwriting when you didn't mean to. So if you get frustrated by the fact that it keeps jumping back, that's why it does it. Okay, next up, we've got the format options. File format, we've got a whole bunch here. JPEG, JPEG 2000, OpenEXR, which uses floating point arithmetic, uh, PDF, PFM, blah, 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 TIFFs, you name it, it's all there. So you can choose the format that you want to export to from this dropdown. Be aware, and it tells you this in the, own, the owner's manual, in the help manual, that if you go with JPEG, JPEG 2000 or TIFF, all of which support the writing of the history states into the metadata of the exported images, that happens by default with JPEG, JPEG 2000 and TIFF. So whatever steps are in the history stack for every image you export, those steps will be written into the metadata of the exported images at the time of export. If you don't want that stuff there, you will need to use a third party tool like EXIF tool to remove that metadata. Me, personally, I don't care if someone sees which modules I used to create that look for an image. But if it bothers you, just be aware that, you know, with JPEG and TIFF, all of the history state will be written into the file on export. Next up, we've got quality. Now, this particularly for JPEG refers to what level of JPEG compression do you want? It's recommended that if you're going to print images or you want a high quality export, leave this at 95. If you want to upload to the web, any setting around 85, 90 will be fine. Okay, moving right along. Next up, we've got global options. First up, we've got maximum size, and there are two fields here. The first field represents the width of the image. The second represents the height of the image. 
Now, if you leave both of these at zero, what it means is that the images will be exported at their original resolution. So if you're shooting with a camera that shoots, you know, 42 megapixels or something even larger than that, entering zero and zero means that, you know, whatever is the native resolution of your RAW files, that's the exported size for the JPEGs. So be aware if you don't want them at full size, you will need to enter some maximum values into these fields. So as you saw, I have presets for everything. So if I go to Facebook, I've basically set my Facebook export to be 2000 pixels wide, regardless of the height and JPEG at quality of 95. If I was to look at, say, my wallpaper export preset, I've got that set to maximum size of 1920 wide, and I don't care about the height because I only use landscape-oriented images for my wallpaper, and I generally crop them at a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, so all of my wallpaper gets exported as 1920 by 1080, and it all goes to my wallpaper folder. So that's how you can use the maximum size value to determine how large your exported images should be. Next up, allow upscaling. Again, this defaults to no. Now, what that means is for this particular preset, my wallpaper preset, where I've set a maximum size of 1920, if an image that I want to export to my wallpaper folder has been cropped or was already at a resolution where the width of the image was less than 1920 pixels, this particular line here, allow upscaling no, means that image will not be upscaled to 1920 on the width. It will be exported at whatever the maximum width is, which is currently less than 1920 pixels. So just be aware that is the default behavior. If you are happy to have your images upscaled, then you need to change that to a yes. Oh, and again, I haven't run Keymon. I am so bad at doing that. Ah. Uh, I will start Keymon right now just for you guys. Okay, profile. There is a whole bunch of output profiles here. What I find interesting, and I, and I will admit, I don't know enough about color theory to know why this is the case, and someone can probably answer this. What I find interesting is that there's no CMYK option. So if you were preparing images for four color offset printing, you would want to export them as CMYK. Now, there might be a reason why that isn't an option, I don't know, but there's a whole bunch of different RGB export options. Generally, if you're exporting to the web, you're gonna go with sRGB. Uh, there might be instances where other profiles will have relevance to you. If that is the case, you probably already know more about it than I do. All right, next up we've got the intent. There are five options here. The first is image settings. Now, you would only use image settings as an option if you have used output color profile as a module in the darkroom for all of the images that you've worked on. And if you have used that module, you can choose a different intent for each image. And so what this option will do is use the intent on a per image basis at the time of export. The default, however, is perceptual, which will try and maintain the lightness and the saturation of all pixels as best it can. If you've been very extreme in your processing, then something will get manipulated at the point of export if you have out of gamut colors. The next option is relative color metric. What this will do is in the case of out of gamut colors, it will keep the lightness 
values for all pixels where they were, but it might change the saturation levels for those pixels which are out of gamut. Then you've got saturation, which does the opposite. For out of gamut colors, it will maintain the level of saturation for all pixels, but those which are out of gamut will get their lightness values changed. And then the final one is absolute color metric, which according to the manual will simply keep the white point where it is in the image. And if it has, has to modify other pixels, then it will do so. Then we've got style. Now, you've probably already seen the video that I made on using styles in Darktable. If you have, great. Hopefully you remembered what we covered. If you don't remember, then I will put a link up in one of the corners uh, to that video so that you can go and check out how to create a style in Darktable that you can then apply to a whole bunch of images in one key click. And the great thing is that here we can then add one of these styles to our image at export. And I'm going to show you my Instagram preset. Now, if you've looked at my Instagram account, you would know that if I was to just pick an image here, I have this frame that I add to my Instagram images and it makes every image square. And I export the images at 2000 by 2000 pixels, ready to upload to Instagram. This is just my little protest against Instagram and their forced aspect ratios. Now, the great thing is, I used to apply this frame to the images in the darkroom view before I exported the images. But now, I don't have to do that, right? I can come back to the light table view and I can add that Instagram frame as a style. Obviously, I had to create that style first and the only thing in the style is simply to add that frame to my image. But I can choose that as a style. And just by the way, if that's set to none, this mode option will be grayed out, right? So I go, I want my Instagram frame as a style to be added at the time of export. And then the mode, I've got two options, replace the history stack or append the history stack. So in this particular instance, I wanna keep all of the processing that's been done that's in the history stack for every image but I just want to add this Instagram frame to the history that already exists for each image. So that's why I've chosen append history, not replace history. If I was to choose replace history, it would then throw away all of the processing that I'd already done on all of these images and then add the frame to just the original raw image. That would look absolutely awful. So just to demonstrate this, I'm going to jump over to my Instagram folder where I've got a whole bunch of images that I've already exported. Um, but what I'll do is I'll export a handful more just to show you. I'll go these three here. And so if I now click on export, you can see that those images are all landscape in orientation. They don't have a frame around them at the moment. We'll click on export. We'll jump over to the Instagram folder. We'll sort by modified. And here are my three new images and they've got the frame applied. But the original versions of those images did not have that frame here in the existing history stack. So that's how you can use that applying of a style and append history to just create 
that custom frame at the time of export. Alrighty, that is a rather lengthy look at the export selected module. Hopefully it's given you a few new ideas on how you can create some presets for the way in which you might want to export images for various use cases. I hope it has helped and uh, feel free to sing out in the comments down below if it did or did not. All right, that will do it for this one. I will see you in the next one.